Dangerous weather from coast to coast. Officials in California are bracing for another storm near Big Sur that could wipe out even more of the famed Pacific Coast Highway. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, millions are reeling from a series of deadly storms from New York to Maine. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Parts of California's Highway 1 slipped away earlier this week because of all the heavy rain we've been seeing, forcing shutdowns up and down the coast today with more storms now on the way. Now, that slip out first happened last Saturday in the Rocky Creek area, leaving only one lane for drivers. Since then, convoys were being used to help drivers navigate through, but those are now canceled until Saturday morning at least. And now there is an evacuation warning. And while Big Sur prepares for worst case scenarios, heavy rain and snow continues to batter New England, leading to thousands of power outages and travel delays up there. NBC News has confirmed at least two deaths over the past day in New York and Pennsylvania, and a lot of close calls, like this one in Connecticut, where a mom says a tree fell on her car while her and her three children were inside. They're all okay, fortunately. And even Lady Liberty could not escape the storm's wrath. Look at these pictures, incredible image capturing the moment lightning struck the Statue of Liberty. Winter alerts are also in effect with more than a foot of snow possible in some areas. The weather's so out of season right now that the National Weather Service literally said it is feeling a lot more like February than April. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman is standing by tracking the latest forecast, forecast across both of those coasts. But first, let's go to NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson on this situation unfolding in Big Sur. Steve, how vulnerable is Highway 1 right now? You know, Gotti, uh, Highway 1 in that area, it seems like it's always vulnerable. And if it isn't wildfire, then it's rock slides. If it isn't rock slides, then it feels like it's mudslides. And if it isn't mudslides, then it's these slipouts, which is a really tame way to say that part of the highway is literally falling into the ocean. That's what happened there in that Rocky Creek area. And, and yeah, officials sure are worried about the next two days because on Thursday into Friday, there is more rain coming. Rain is what saturates the ground that leads to these slip outs. So, you know, we're only expecting maybe about a half inch or so, but it's sure enough to cancel the convoys, as you mentioned, that have been in and out of town. About 300 people every day from 8 a.m. There's one there and then 4 p.m. there's one there. They're shutting those down until Saturday just for about a half inch of rain because they're worried about the structural integrity specifically of that part of the highway. It is a concern and something for people to worry about, of course, as officials are doing all they can to get repairs going. Got it? For repairs on a road where a detour in that area will be like three, four, five hours just to go around. Yep. And this isn't the first time Highway 1 has been closed because of slipouts, right? This has been a problem for a while. <sighs> Far from it, man. I mean, I think we have a map that we can show you. So that area is roughly Carmel by the sea area. If you know this, guys, if you're watching at home, you know how beautiful that stretch of land is. But it's also treacherous, and that road shuts down a lot, just maybe 40 miles to the south. There are three more of these slip outs, all hmm. sort of clustered in a row. I know this uh, because my wife and I were taking a vacation in Monterey. <laughs> we tried to drive all the way down on the one to L.A. and had to double back the entire way because it was shut down in that area. It's happened hmm. in 2018, 2011 in that Rocky Creek area. There was another one. 2017, I was there for NBC talking to business owners because of another disaster that happens when the road in the area is is shut down, which is tourism, is really suffering. It is the only viable industry for a place like Big Sur. And some businesses say they're telling me that they're losing anywhere from, you know, $500,000 every single day to even more than that when it comes to the state of California. So it is a huge concern and a huge hassle. And more than that, it's cutting into people's livelihoods as well, guy. Cutting into people's livelihoods in one of the most beautiful places, I, I think, on planet Earth. Uh, in February, we saw some dramatic images of luxury homes a little bit further south, well, actually a lot further south, literally yeah. hanging on by the edge of cliffs after all of this rain. Are, are we seeing a lot more of this kind of stuff or are we just more aware of them when they happen these days? 
You know, I think it's a combination of both. Certainly, we didn't have the proliferation of drone footage that we can sort of see everything happening now. Of course, there wasn't as much rain as in years previous, but also experts say that this is just simply accelerating. Uh, our colleague Liz Kreutz is working on a story about erosion. She's telling me that places like Carlsbad are actually implementing laws to try to push back parts of the highway from the ocean because they're worried about scenarios just like this, moving train tracks in some communities. Santa Barbara seeing houses on cliff sides where people have to leave because they may fall into the sea. So it certainly is accelerating. Uh, and the science of that, you know, is really terrifying for a lot of people that live close to the coast. Uh, and we're seeing more of it. Got it. Nothing permanent about a coast these days. Steve Patterson, thank yeah. you so much. You got it. And let's bring in NBC's meteorologist, Michelle Grossman. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. What's the forecast for this storm first here in the West? Hi there, Gotti. Great to see you. Well, as Steve mentioned, we're not going to get a ton of rain, but it's not going to take much to make those roadways more vulnerable. So this is what the storm looks like right now on radar. It's an area of low pressure moving inland. We're looking at some heavy rain in spots. That's where you're seeing the brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. You're seeing blue, too, because we're going to see snow falling. And we are seeing snow falling at this hour. Could see 6 to 12 inches in Sierra Nevada. So this is a powerful storm with lots of wind as well. That is tonight into tomorrow. Then as we look towards tomorrow, we're going to see showers still dampening uh, portions of California. Again, very spotty tomorrow, but could see some heavier downpours at times. That's where you're seeing those brighter colors. Again, the reds, the orange, the yellows. So once again, rain and snow expected for portions of California. Then as we get into Saturday, this will be our next cross-country storm. So we're looking at that heavy snow and wind into the northern Rockies. We're going to see strong storms in the central plains could see some hail with that. Also the chance of a tornado or two. So let's talk about rainfall amounts. Where you see these lighter green colors, that's lighter amounts. That's corresponding to a quarter inch to a half inch, as Steve mentioned earlier. But could see pockets of heavier rain where you're seeing the yellow there. That's going to indicate uh, up to an inch of rain in some spots. So we're going to watch this very, very closely. Also a whole lot of snow once again in April in the higher mountains. That's welcome news for the skiers there. But could see 12 inches in some spots, 18 inches in others. And that's where you're seeing the pinks and also the purples, but the blue, you're going to see quite a bit of snow as well. So we have wind alerts in place. This is going to be a big story as well because this is going to kick up the fire danger. We're looking at 8 million people impacted for wind advisories, high wind watches, high wind warnings, the high wind warnings. That is in uh, the purple there. So Eli into portions of Colorado as well. We're looking at high wind watch. Uh, wind advisories in the lighter blue. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the peak wind gusts. They're going to be pretty gusty. We're looking at Las Vegas, 43 miles per hour. Elko, 48. Salt Lake City, 39. Page up to 43 miles per hour as well. Here's a severe threat as we move further uh, to the east. This would be by Saturday. So we get a break in terms of severe weather tomorrow. But again, we could see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, damaging hail, tornado risks very low, but still it's not zero. Gotti? Michelle Grossman, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And get this, this storm season, we could run out of names for hurricanes and tropical storms. A forecast from the Colorado State University is predicting 23 name stores in the Atlantic. We only have 21 names right now, and all indications are that this could be a historically bad season. National Climate reporter Chase Kane explains how humans have might have inadvertently helped supercharge this hurricane season. Our oceans have never been hotter. Brian McNoldy at the University of Miami highlights that in the region of the Atlantic, where hurricanes often form, temperatures are already at July levels in April. But our oceans aren't just hot at the surface, they're getting warm at much greater depths, known as ocean heat content. And that is driven by oceans absorbing more than 90% of the heat created by humans burning coal, oil, and gas. And as the water gets warmer even deeper, you can think of that like being an even bigger fuel tank, allowing hurricanes to strengthen dangerously fast, like Hurricane Ian or Hurricane Otis. Tropical storm one day, category five hurricane the next, nearly without warning. One of the biggest fears that, that I, as a hurricane forecaster, have had to internalize over the last 15, 20 years is the fact that we're seeing more of these tropical storms undergo these rapid intensification cycles. John Morales is hurricane specialist for NBC Miami, and he's worried about the combination of unnatural ocean heat with the natural shift to La Nina. So now all these things are pulling in the same direction towards what could be a hyperactive hurricane season in 2024, along with 
extremely powerful hurricanes, the catastrophic ones that we really need to be concerned about. Along with being stronger, climate change is allowing hurricanes to travel farther outside their usual zones more often. Last year, a rare tropical system plowed through Southern California, and even northernmost Maine faced repeated close calls from storms, with Lee striking Canada. The hurricanes that are coming from the tropics are able to sustain their intensity higher up into northern latitudes where you wouldn't expect the hurricanes to be as strong. So people along the eastern seaboard from the mid-Atlantic all the way to New England are having to start to think about threats that they wouldn't have thought about in the past because of these, the changing climate. And no matter how this hurricane season plays out, one of the goals of these forecasts is to communicate the risk so that you can prepare now. In New York, I'm national climate reporter Chase Kane. Chase, thank you. Over in Taiwan, rescue crews are still racing to reach hundreds of people that are trapped some 24 hours after that historic earthquake hit. More than 200 aftershocks have happened since then, and at least 10 people have been killed, and over 1,000 people have been hurt. And more videos are coming out now that are showing the moments that 7.4 magnitude earthquake hit. And Take a look at this one. This is a group of nurses at a hospital struggling to protect newborn babies in what looks like a nursery there. Just insane stuff. Officials say that many of those trapped are safe right now, but they're in areas that don't have access to roads at the moment. However, aftershocks and weather are now becoming a huge concern. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has more. This is Hualien. You can see the building behind me is tilting very precariously. That's the force with which the earthquake struck here. And this was the hardest hit area. We're about 11 miles from the epicenter and the numbers continue to rise. More than a thousand people have been injured and hundreds are said to be trapped. Uh, emergency crews and helicopters were able to reach dozens of mine workers uh, who had been trapped in two quarries. The focus for search and rescue efforts is in the mountain areas around here. It's where hundreds of people have been cut off. Uh, landslides are blocking roads. They're, they're caught between the rock falls. People are stuck in tunnels. There are dozens who are at a hotel in a national park. Rescue teams have been able to get food and water to them, some medical care if necessary, but it will be a slow process uh, to try to get those people out to safety. Uh, landslides are, are blocking most major routes. There's debris and falling rock. A dash cam video today uh, said it all. It, it showed boulders rolling down the road and crushing cars. Uh, the other challenge for rescue teams right now, aftershocks. There have been more than 300 of them since the initial earthquake. And now weather is becoming a factor with rain coming into the forecast. Here in the city, officials are taking a hard look at any buildings that have been significantly damaged. The one behind us uh, will be demolished tomorrow uh, as they continue to clean up and move ahead from this most powerful quake in a quarter century. Janice Mackey Freyer in Taiwan, thank you so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, Joe Biden's strong words for Benjamin Netanyahu after Israeli airstrikes killed seven aid workers. That and some other stories we're watching from around the world are straight ahead. Plus, a massive Easter Sunday heist. And those thieves stole, sit thieves stole a lot more than, than chocolate eggs. Police are hunting for the culprits who swiped nearly $30 million in cash. NBC's Elwin Lopez will have the deep details. And later this hour, meet the minds behind the new moon buggy. NASA has awarded three contracts to build a moon rover, and we've got one of the engineers with us tonight. I got a sneak peek at this bad boy just a few years ago, and it turns on a dime. Stay tuned. You think you could beat 11 miles an hour on the moon with this? I think so, yeah. All right, so we're on max speed right here on Earth. Let's give it a go. Yep. Hey, welcome back. In a tense conversation today, President Biden seemed to warn Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that further support for his country 
will be contingent on its treatment of civilians in Gaza. That story in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. Some of the top lawyers and judges in the UK are pressuring its government in writing to stop selling weapons to Israel. They're warning that by continuing to do so, it is breaking international law. Now, the 17-page letter calls the present situation in Gaza, quote, catastrophic and says that since the International Criminal Court found a pretty good risk of genocide happening there, the UK is legally bound to do something about it. The French President Emmanuel Macron says he has, quote, no doubt that Russia will target the Paris Olympics this summer, but he's not referring to any specific intelligence that says so. Macron's comments represent his most explicit acknowledgement that something could happen at the Olympic Games. The Russian embassy in Paris did not immediately respond to a request for comment. And at least 27 people are dead in Iran tonight after an attack on Iran's Revolutionary Guards headquarters. Sunni Muslim militants are suspected to be behind the attack. The area where it happened borders Afghanistan and Pakistan and has long been a place where Iranian security forces and Sunni militants have battled it out. And NATO is celebrating its 75th birthday at its headquarters in Brussels today. Officials and diplomats talked about how the alliance came about in the shadows of World War II with just 12 European and North American countries. Today, there are 32 and there are still committed to the promise that one attack on a NATO nation would be an attack on all the nations. But just days after an Israeli strike killed seven World Central Kitchen aid workers in the Gaza Strip, President Joe Biden had a phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and the two men talked for about a half hour. And according to those familiar with the call, the call was reportedly tense at times, with Biden calling the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza unacceptable. He demanded that Israel immediately allow aid trucks into Gaza and agree to a ceasefire. Biden went on to say that if a ceasefire is not agreed upon, the relationship between the two countries could significantly change. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is outside the White House for us tonight. Gabe, it's been reported that the president was very angry after the World Central Kitchen attack news broke. What else do we know about the behind the scenes there and, and how this call went down? I, I know the president apparently also said something along the lines of, I don't say I don't love Israel or something like that. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. more? Look, Gotti, it was a very difficult message that the president needs to get across. And as you know, uh, President Biden has repeatedly said that he has been a staunch supporter of Israel for decades. But the comment you just mentioned is something that we're hearing from two U.S. officials and also a person familiar with the call. The president saying that um, he, he told Prime Minister Netanyahu, don't say that I don't love Israel. Again, pointing to his many decades of support for the U.S.'s a staunch ally. And that's uh, maybe seen as trying to preempt any notion mm. that the U.S. was wavering in its support for Israel. That also came up in the White House briefing today. But, uh, Gadi, as we're hearing about this call, this was a much tougher tone than that um, President Biden has been taking. This is the first phone call between the two leaders in nearly three weeks. And it was a direct result of that strike that killed those seven humanitarian aid workers. And we're hearing from two U.S. officials that President Biden strongly implied that he may condition further U.S. military aid to Israel based on whether Israel can really try to protect civilians and try to help with the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, Gabi. And Gabe, just this week, we saw some Muslim leaders refuse to participate in the annual Ramadan meal at the White House. That is this long-standing annual tradition there. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between President Biden and Muslim Americans right now and how all that could play a role in, in a modified ad attitude towards Israel? Well, to say, Gadi, that it is incredibly strained is an understatement. You're right. Uh, that uh, traditional dinner uh, here at the White House, it actually had to be scaled back. It ended up being just a, a policy meeting uh, that was held here at the White House. There was one prominent um, Arab American doctor who actually walked out of the White House in, in mm -hmm. protest. Um, and there has been a lot of anger, especially over the past several months. And I've been uh, reporting from places like uh, Minnesota and especially Michigan, of course, where this could make a huge difference in the presidential 
federal election. Of course, Michigan being a key battleground state and with its large Arab American population, they've been incredibly frustrated with the president. And some have even said they would even consider voting for former President Trump or more likely mm. that they would just stay home. And that is a could be a huge problem for Democrats and it's something the Biden campaign is looking at. Now, a big question will be whether um, the president's uh, slightly changing position or more frustration with Netanyahu, whether that will change any of their minds, Gabby. Kip, this is a really difficult question, but we've seen tough talk in different variations throughout this entire time. Uh, if there is a timeline as to the changing of the United States' policy towards uh, Israel right now, what would that timeline possibly look like? Well, today, uh, the White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby was asked that exact question. He actually came back and said that the U.S. expects these changes uh, to happen within the next few hours or even days. Huh. So not a very lengthy timeline here. And the U.S. is really trying to make its case to Israel. And Gotti, you got to look back. Look back a couple months. This war is, near, is nearing almost six months now. And if you remember in the early days of this war, remember how the U.S. and the White House uh, was said over and over again that it did not want to tell Israel what to do. Well, look where we are. Right now, the U.S. is trying to tell Israel what to do in a way, but John Kirby, the White House national security spokesman, insisted today that it is possible to do two things. One, to still support Israel steadfastly, but at the same time be frustrated with how it is conducting its war inside Gaza and to try and uh, urge Prime Minister Netanyahu to be more careful uh, with uh, civilian, civilian casualties. But yes, as we mentioned, Gadi, it was the death of those seven humanitarian aid workers that really pushed President Biden to have this call today with Prime Minister Netanyahu, Gadi. Jim Gutierrez, I always appreciate your insightful reporting. Thanks so much. And several charities, including the World Central Kitchen, have suspended their operations in Gaza as a result, a result of that deadly airstrike earlier this week. And now there are some calls for an independent investigation into the IDF. NBC's Raf Sanchez has more from Tel Aviv. Israel's military says it is investigating the killing of those seven aid workers. But now World Central Kitchen says that's not enough. They want to see an independent investigation conducted by a third party. They are calling on Israel to preserve evidence, and they say there are a lot of unanswered questions. The top of the list, how is it that Israeli forces open fire on that aid convoy with, remember, multiple airstrikes when those vehicles were clearly marked with the logo of the World Central Kitchen and when the aid group had coordinated their movements with the Israeli military ahead of time? Now, I had the opportunity earlier to speak to the parents of Jacob Flickinger. He is, was a 33-year-old U.S.-Canadian citizen. He was a volunteer with World Central Kitchen. He was among the seven dead. His parents telling me they also don't have confidence in this Israeli probe. They want to hear an apology from the Israeli government. They want to hear a whole lot more than that. And they are also saying that they are just two people who are suffering right now, the searing grief that comes with the loss of their only son. But they point out that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of families who have lost somebody in Gaza. They are calling for a ceasefire. They want their son's work to continue to feed those people on the brink of famine right now. We are two people who suffer because we've lost our only self, but we're only two. There are thousands and thousands. There are, yeah. you know, five other World Central Kitchen mm -hmm. aid workers killed in this attack. There were 200 uh, aid workers in Gaza that have been killed. Now, a couple of hours before that Israeli airstrike in Gaza that killed those aid workers, there was an explosion at the Iranian embassy in Syria. Iran saying it was an Israeli attack, that it killed a number of senior officers with the Revolutionary Guard. And over the last day, Iranian leaders have been vowing revenge. Israel tonight is on high alert. 
Its air defense systems are ready. The Israeli military has canceled leave for combat soldiers because they are bracing for possible retaliation. An Israeli official tells me at this point, there is no concrete intelligence that indicates that an attack is imminent, but there is a lot of concern here. The Israeli military confirming that it is jamming GPS systems, which means that people's Google Maps aren't working in some cases, and this is a threat that's being taken seriously. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much. And still to come, a $30 million heist. How in the world did thieves get their hands on all that money? And was it an inside job? We're taking a look next, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following right now. The San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department released body cam footage leading up to a dramatic fatal shooting involving a 17-year-old teen going through a mental health crisis. And this happened on Tuesday inside a Victorville foster home. The teen had allegedly locked himself inside a bathroom, threatening to hurt himself with a knife when officers rushed in to try to arrest him. He was shot by a deputy and later died at the hospital. One deputy was hurt after a struggle with a teen in a bathtub, and an investigation is currently underway. Brian Koberger, the Idaho College murder suspect, was back in court today. His lawyers are asking for a change in venue in another county for an unbiased jury. But prosecutors say his defense team violated the court's gag order by surveying potential jurors and asking them questions about the case. A hearing for a potential change of venue will be set later this year. And there is some beef between a couple of airports in California. The Oakland International Airport is looking to rebrand by adding San Francisco Bay to its name to help boost business. But the San Francisco International Airport isn't happy about the proposed plan, saying it'll only create confusion for travelers as Oakland's airport isn't actually located in San Francisco. And staying out west for this wild cash grab straight out of Hollywood. Technically, it was like 15 miles outside of Hollywood, but tell me if you've heard this plot before. LAPD and the FBI are looking for up to $30 million missing from a money storage facility in San Fernando Valley. Police say the break-ins, it's one of the largest burglaries in city history, and according to the LA Times, the burglars broke in the building on Easter Sunday and were able to access a safe where the money was stored. You can see what appears to be some damage and debris in the back of the building, and here's what one employee who preferred to remain anonymous had to say about that crime. I didn't even know there was $30 million, whatever the amount is, in that building, just to think that they were able to go through the security system and get away with all that money, it's, uh, it's a shocker. Was it an inside job? Uh, was it just one person? Was it a group? Was it an inside job? Was it just one person? Those are the questions. NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez joins us with, uh, with some more. Oh, wait, okay, so first of all, I'm gonna need alibis for like George Clooney, for Brad Pitt, for like all of <laughs> the Ocean Eleven guys. Yeah, exactly. Somehow. But seriously, is it, this kind of seems, in, I didn't say it, he said it, but inside job definitely sounds. Well, listen, it's a multi-million dollar mystery, right? Investigators really trying to figure out exactly how those burglars went not only inside the building, but inside that vault without triggering the alarms. That's the big question here. How were they able to do that? Of course, they're looking at the potential of there being an inside job. You saw that wall there. You can see that hole. It's been boarded up, some debris on the side. Investigators haven't confirmed if that's part of the heist. So they're still looking into that. But what's interesting about all of this is it happened Easter Sunday mm -hmm. at night. It happened when no one was there. And Monday morning, these operators of the facility saw it and figured out, hey, some, and tons of money here right. missing. And so now the FBI and the LAPD are looking into this. Okay, so time out again. Uh, facility, wow. like money storage facility, I thought those were banks. This place looks like Fort Knox, no windows, bunch of security, you know, like yeah. you've got the armored cars outside. There are storage facilities just for money? I didn't even know that. Yeah, so a lot of people initially when they saw this story, it, everyone said undisclosed facility. Mm because these are not really known about in the public, right? For good reason, as we can see right. here. So a lot of times you think of those armored vehicles going from 
the business to the bank, from the bank to the business. But there are these large money storage facilities all across the country. Hmm. This one happened to be in the San Fernando Valley, right? But it is a place where they store up tons of cash. We know that tens of millions of dollars went missing, stolen. So now that's something that, of course, they're looking into. But yeah, these exist. And clearly, there's a reason as to why it's not common knowledge, yeah, right? The, the secret's out now. Yeah. Alan, thanks so much for joining <laughs> thanks, us. Scotty. And today, the busiest travel day of the spring break season. The FAA is expecting to see 50,000 flights before the day is through, which is 5,000 more than usual. Now, spring breakers are partly to blame, but there's also a surge in travelers hoping to see next week's solar eclipse in the path of totality. All this while parts of the U.S. continue to get battered with some severe weather. And NBC News anchor Yasmin Vesogian has the latest from New York's LaGuardia Airport. Yasmin? Scotty, it's been really back and forth today. We've seen a lot of big student groups traveling for spring break, which is to be expected. But you talk about numbers, right? 50,000 flights so far um, today. That's about 5,000 more than normal. 48,000 expected tomorrow um, as well. It's the confluence of these two big events, right? You've got spring breakers coming and going. And then you have the eclipse on Monday with folks traveling within that path of totality to see that incredible event. Some of the numbers that we're getting in when it comes to delays, uh, cancellations. Take a look at this board. Um, you've got some delays and cancellations on this board right now. About 5,000 domestic delays throughout the day. 500 cancellations um, as well. I've been speaking to folks all day. Here's what one woman had to say. The closer we got to this coming weekend, the more expensive it got. So that's one of the reasons we decided to travel on Easter. <laughs> Got it. And then kind of do our days in New York City yeah. during the weekday. So, Gotti, one of the reasons why I heard um, people are traveling today specifically is because it's not the weekend, right? Not the end of spring break, but a couple of days before that eclipse. If you are traveling for the eclipse, I got a couple of tips for you. Pack your patience first and foremost, right? Because there may be some delays. There may be some cancellations with all the weather that's all around the country, but but also there's going to be a lot of traffic jams, a lot of folks driving to the destination. If they're flying, there could be a lack of parking at the airport. And then you think about that path of totality, right? From Texas all the way up to Maine, Texas expecting about a million travelers, possibly Indiana, Ohio, a half a million travelers as well. If you're going to one of those small airports, there's less options of coming in and out. So all of these things really to take into consideration as you're making your way traveling around the country, coming to and from spring break and or wanting to see that eclipse happen on Monday, Gotti. NBC's Yasmin Vesuvian, thanks so very much. Now, this next story, they're calling it Cicada Geddon. And if you near, you live near them, you know how noisy cicada, cicadas can get. But this year, parts of the U.S. will see like biblical levels of a mass invasion. That's because two different cicadas that usually pop their bodies out of the ground to get frisky every 13 to 17 years are coming out at the same time. And if you live in the Midwest or the Southeast, get ready because up to a trillion, that is a trillion with a T of those bugs are going to show up in numbers we haven't seen in literally centuries. I mean, the last time this happened, Thomas Jefferson was president. And joining us now is Dr. Gene Kritsky. He's the Dean of Behavioral and Natural Sciences at Mount Joseph University. Thank you so much for being with us, Professor. Cicadas in and of themselves are, are not a rare occurrence. So can you explain a little more clearly why this year is this super brood and how does this work? Well, you're right. The, the, the emergence of cicadas is not unusual. It happens usually 12, 12 out of every 17 years. But this year is different because we've got two different broods emerging during the same year. Uh, brood 13, which is a 17-year cicada emerging in northern Illinois and, and, and in close environs. And then brood 19, which is a 13-year cicada emerging through the southern, uh, northern parts of the southern states. And uh, as you mentioned, this last time these two specific broods emerged, uh, was in 1803 when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. And what makes this so much more of an interest to people is that there are areas in Illinois where the two popular, the two broods will slightly overlap. Uh, hmm. I think some people may have the wrong idea that there's going to be billions more at that spot because it's at the extreme edge of both of the broods. But that hmm. in itself, the close proximity is very unusual. Ah, and so what does a billion, what to do tr a trillion cicadas sound like? I mean, how, how loud could this get? And, and Professor, I mean, I ask you this 
with the very loud uh, wallpaper behind you. I mean, I can already hear them in my ears. What are we going to hear? Well, I have measured cicadas uh, uh, in, in large emergencies up to 96 decibels. And to put that in perspective, mm. uh, where I measured that was a cemetery on the flight path towards Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky International Airport. And you couldn't hear the jets anymore. What? The cicadas were so loud. Wow. And so this is this is going to be something that everyone is experiencing in, in those areas, and they're going to be experiencing them day in, day out. Uh, here's something that I did not think that we'd be talking about this year, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about this cicada STD thing that's going around? Like, are, is there an STD that is going to mm -hmm. ravage cicadas? Well, what, what it is, uh, the cicadas get a fungal disease. Uh, we're okay. not sure how the nymphs get it in the first place, but we do have evidence to suggest that indeed it is spread during the adult population through uh, sexual contact. And so it is an STD in that case. And the, the reason that we have that evidence is because we find germinating spores inside the reproductive systems of, of cicadas. Uh, and what's unusual about this particular fungal disease is it turns males into hypersexualizes them and they start acting like females when they hear another male cicada uh, sing its mating song. And uh, that's rather unusual. And uh, uh, so <laughs> it's not going to ravage everything, but probably in some of the more denser areas, anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of the cicadas towards the end of the emergence might be exhibiting uh, the sign of the fungus disease. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. So this fungal disease hypersexualizes the cicadas when they hear the mating call, and then they just do more of well, that, or does it stop the procreation? Or I mean, is this is this well, going males, to reduce? The let's look at males in particular. When a male that's infected with the fungus hears another male call, he responds mm -hmm. to that male like he's a female. In other words, females right. don't have a call. They basically flick their wings at a certain point in the call. And so when an infected male hears another male sing, he flicks his wings and pretending and gives the signal that he's a female. The huh. uninfected amorous male comes in and uh, gets inoculated. Wow. Okay. So he gets inoculated, but that the male doesn't get pregnant. Does this mean that there are possibly no. going to be less cicadas? Well, it means that those cicadas, what usually happens in many cases, some of the cicadas have already laid all their eggs and already mated. Mm, okay. But uh, uh, when, you, when you say there might be fewer cicadas out there, we know that the average female has about 500 eggs. Uh, there's going to be a trillion of these things. That means there's going to be half a trillion females times 500. So I don't think that the fewer eggs being laid is, is a real issue for the cicadas. This is the craziest biology lesson I've ever had, Dr. Gene Chris. Thank you so well, thank very you. much for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure. And coming up, could smoking weed lead to psychotic disorders? Dr. Akshay Sayal will be here with more on that. But first, you got to see this. This is a missing California dog who turned up over 2,000 miles away in Michigan. Homeward Bound style, Detroit police responded to a call about a stray dog last week, and they connected it to a pet adoption society. Now, Mishka, the three-year-old pup, had an identity chip that was used to connect her back to her owner in San Diego, where she went missing from last summer. The owner happened to be in Minneapolis spending time with his family for Easter and drove 10 hours to reunite his pup. Amishka made it all the way from California to Detroit. That is a tale only she lives to tell. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. A new study has some warnings about today's weed. That's coming up in just a minute. But first, here's some headlines we're watching tonight. A crane collapse in Fort Lauderdale has killed one person and hurt at least three others. Police say the victim killed was a worker on the construction site. The crane also crushed a car when it slammed into the ground there. This morning, Oklahoma executed death row inmate Michael Dwayne Smith for killing two people back in 2002. Now, in March, Smith's legal team and family made a final attempt to save his life, arguing he had a tough childhood and used drugs, but the board voted against clemency for him. And a judge denied former President Donald Trump's bid to toss out his classified documents case again. Trump tried to say that the papers were considered personal under the Presidential Records Act, and the judge was not having it, saying the charges make no reference to the act. Trump's trial is scheduled to begin May 20th. We are learning more about the man who drove his SUV into a barricade at an FBI office in Atlanta earlier this week. Federal authorities say Irvin Lee Bowling is an ex-military member who had online ties to QAnon-related content. 
He faces a charge of destroying government property. And almost two weeks ago, we told you this story about a new medical milestone. Take a quick listen to that. And turning now to what could be a massive medical breakthrough as doctors at Mass General say that they have successfully put the first kidney from a genetically modified pig into a living human. Now, there is a lot to process in that last sentence, and we're gonna break down the whole pig genetic modification part in just a second. But first, let's start with the human part of this equation. His name is Richard Slayman. He is 62 years old, and he had surgery to get his new kidney on Saturday. He is now recovering and could be headed home as soon as this weekend. So fast forward to today, how's he doing? Well, as of this morning, Richard Slayman is out of the hospital following a successful transplant. Slayman says he is feeling great. His doctors say the kidney is doing everything it needs to do. They said the transplant gives hope for thousands of patients in. And not sure if you knew this, but the weed of today is not the same ganja as your grandparents or maybe even your parents smoked back in the day. We are talking about the weed in those smoke shops opening up all across the country, and research is showing the sticky icky on the market today is way more potent. And now two separate studies are suggesting a link between heavy marijuana use and psychosis. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has that story. Kristen Gilliland wishes she could play one more song with her son Anders. He, um, a very loving creative, a deep thinker. This is him. Around 14, Anders started smoking marijuana. Kristen didn't approve, but also wasn't overly concerned. It's already medically legal in California at the time. Maybe it's not such, like, the worst vice to have. Exactly, because when I was growing up, it was much less potent mm -hmm. than it is now. You didn't realize that? that I had no problem. idea. No idea. She's not alone. Government surveys show adults increasingly see marijuana use as less risky, and nearly 30% of high school seniors reported having used marijuana in the past year. At 17, Kristen says Anders started losing contact with reality. He thought that there were higher beings that were communicating with him. Kristen happens to be a neuroscientist and now believes smoking weed led to her son's psychotic bouts and triggered his eventual schizophrenia. Anders started self-medicating with other drugs to quiet the voices and died from an overdose when he was 22. I, I knew something was wrong. If he had never started using cannabis, he might still be here. You really think that? Yeah. The number of smoke shops and dispensaries are skyrocketing, with more states relaxing marijuana laws, making it easier for anyone to get a hold of high-potency THC products. Marijuana in the 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s was about 2 to 3 percent THC. And nowadays, uh, with the commercialized products, they are routinely 20 plus percent, so about 10 times more potent. Child psychiatrist Dr. Christian Thurstone says that's playing a role in the rise in cannabis-induced psychosis among teens. Research is still ongoing, but one study found daily use of high-potency marijuana with over 15 percent THC resulted in five times the risk of psychosis. Another study found nearly half of patients with cannabis-induced psychosis went on to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Come on. Kristen now heads outreach at Vanderbilt's Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery and urges young people to avoid marijuana. If they could understand the superpowers they have with their developing brain, why would you want to put anything in it that's going to take away that superpower? Kate Snow, NBC News, Nashville. And NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us now. Dr. Sayal, thank you so much for joining us. This kind of feels a lot like a, like a throwback to the days where, I don't know, good old Uncle Sam would say, be careful, youngins, weed can make you insane. Uh, I didn't know there was even a movie about it way back in the 30s called Reefer Madness. So... So times have changed, but so has the science of marijuana, right? And the potency. How, how dangerous and addictive is this really, especially compared to, I don't know, alcohol? 
Right, yeah. So, Gotti, for the longest time, people were saying, you know, marijuana doesn't really carry a risk of addiction or you don't really build a tolerance to it. You know, just go ahead and use it and, and you'll be fine because it's a plant, it's natural. Um, but, Gotti, as more, we're learning more and more, we're, we're finding out that, you know, you do build a tolerance to this thing. About one in 10 people uh, who use cannabis will be addicted or develop cannabis use disorder, meaning that your life becomes significantly disrupted. You have to keep using cannabis, you stop mm -hmm. going to, you know, socialize with your friends, that sort of thing. Um, so as the science is evolving, and, and Gadi, to be clear, we still need a lot more research on this. It is just a, a hard thing to research as it is illegal at a federal level. Um, but we're learning that there are some risks, especially if you're, if you're a, a young man. Uh, you know, people in their, in their high teens to early 20s are at risk of developing psychosis, like, uh, like the son uh, uh, Anders you heard from, from Kristen there. And for the longest time, we thought weed equals stoned. But now we're talking psychosis. What? How did that come about? So I've talked to a lot of researchers about this, Gotti, and, and while we don't know the exact mechanism of what's going on, what they think is happening is the way that the marijuana works in your brain is it activates cannabinoid receptors, it overactivates them, and there's something going on there where it becomes hard to differentiate what's in your head uh, versus what's in what's reality. And you can see here how much the potency has risen over the years, about two to three percent um, decades ago, and now you can get up to 35 percent THC. And Gotti actually called a dispensary um, out in Colorado. I spoke to a guy, Patrick Johnson, who's been in the business for, for a decade or so, and he's telling me that, you know, everyone who comes in now is asking for the strong stuff. Everybody just wants 30 plus percent. Mm. Nobody's really buying the, you know, they go as low as 14 percent in his shop. Nobody really buys it. So a lot of this is consumer demand that's, that's driving this. And for people that are watching that, that do use marijuana, is there a form that's better to consume than others? Like, is it better to eat rather than to smoke? Yeah, so for those who do consume marijuana, um, you know, in talking to experts, it does seem that edibles are, at least seem to be safer in the sense that you know exactly what you're getting. So, for example, edibles can come in, up, you know, typically 5 to 10 milligrams a dose versus if you're smoking, let's say you get a joint, uh, it's about a gram and it's 20 percent THC. So in that joint, there would be 200 milligrams of THC. It's not really clear how much of that is getting in your body because a lot of it is lost in what's called side stream smoke, which is, you know, in between hits of the joint, the, the, the joint kind of blows off and a lot of that THC is lost. We have no idea how much of that's actually getting in your body. So for those who are using marijuana, our advice, you know, start at the lowest dose possible. And if you can, try to consume edible versus smoking because it's just not clear how much of that is getting in your body right now. And make sure you do the milligram math before you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Akshay Sayal, thank you so very much. Anytime. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything that's coming up next. And we are two years away from the Artemis III manned mission to the moon, the first since 1972. And with humans headed back to the lunar surface, they're going to need a new set of wheels. So here is the $4 billion question. Are those future... Lunar rovers going to look kind of like the sciencey fiction buggies that we saw in movies like Ed Astra? Or are they going to look kind of like forkliftish chariots that can grab and carry cargo and work on building col colonies autonomously? Maybe, hopefully, it's all of the above because NASA has awarded contracts to three companies to develop new lunar terrain vehicles in order to help Artemis astronauts explore the moon's surface. And one of them, Venturi Astrolabs, let us take their concept for a spin a little while back. And joining us now is one of the engineers working on the Venturi Astrolab rover, Kelly Randall. Kelly, first off, congratulations. This is huge. I'll never forget testing your rover, but I, I gotta ask, take us through the big differences between the rovers that we saw way back in the Apollo days to what you guys are working on today. Thanks, Scotty. We're also so excited. I first wanted to just like say that we're so honored that NASA chose Flex to be part of the Lunar Train Vehicle Program. It's super exciting. I think one of the things that really differentiates Flex, um, which is the flexible logistics and exploration rover, precisely is that versatility. It is such a flexible, um, modular designed vehicle. So what really differentiates it is, unlike some rovers in the past, were, which were crew first or science first, Flex is really logistics first. So we're really working to set the standard for logistics on the moon. And that is what makes it really unique. And when you talk about modular, what exactly do you mean? I mean, crude means that back in the day, we always had to have our astronauts there. Now, all of a sudden, everything is autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, what modular systems are you all built in? So 
For the LTV program, we're going to be able to carry two suited astronauts. So we have what's called a crew interface on our LTV uh, rover. Um, but we actually have three um, payload interfaces that enable Flex to be, as we said, super flexible. So you can imagine all the different kinds of configurations that you might need for a mission. So if you were going to do a resource utilization on the moon, or if you needed to provide sort of last mile ca cargo delivery, you can imagine um, in the context of Earth, like you have shipping containers mm -hmm. and they can go on a ship, they go on a train, they go on a truck. And they're usually so the same size. They're usually the same size. So there's a standard there mm -hmm. that is really versatile and flexible. So that's what we're doing with Flex. It's designed to be multiple configurations, whatever mission our customer has, whatever payloads they have, they can put them on Flex. Uh, some people might be wondering like, yeah, but where's, it? thinking maybe like a pickup truck for cargo, you all are putting it underneath. This thing is We're like a crab and then just pulls it up and then moves these things around. It's kind of like Legos a little bit, right? One of the ways, I'm, I'm a bit of a Lego geek. I was a big Lego Technic fan when I was a kid. And I imagine sometimes Flex as a big Lego Technic set. So you have our uh, Flex Rover, which is the main structure. And then you have all these pieces that you want to put on. So say you want to do a crewed mission and you have different scientific experiments that you want to do. So you're going to put the crew on there. You're going to put the robotic arm on there. You're going to put all of these science experiments here underneath. You can actually put some on the top deck. We actually have a mast. You can put some on there. And now you have this vehicle that can take your crew and go do those um, exploration missions. Or if you want to look at some kind of utilization, resource utilization mission, you can take the crew out. You can put more payloads there. You can put different payloads on the top deck. You can have an extraction arm instead of our robotic arm. Um, and then now you have a completely different configuration that you can use for that particular mission. So I think what's really unique is unlike uh, rover missions in the past, it's not just that one mission and then that's all it does. Flex can do everything. Now, it is by design, by its name, it's completely flexible. When we're talking about the future of the lunar surface, the future of Mars, we're going to have to build some yeah. colonies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just going to have to happen. How does, how does Flex work into that equation? Well, we're really imagining Flex um, as w one, of it, one of its utilizations as what we call that last mile cargo delivery. So you can imagine one of the exciting things about Flex, too, is that it can go on any rocket. Wait, wait, it's like the lime scooter of, like, the lunar <laughs> yes. surface. Exactly. Okay. I mean, we're going to be the Uber of the right. lunar surface with our crew. <laughs> we're going to be the FedEx of right. the moon. So... You put all of your payloads onto the lunar surface. They just landed. Everything's great. So now, how do you get that payload to where you need it to go? Say you're building a lunar habitation. What is taking you to the place that you're then going to build that? How are you moving your equipment around? How are you moving your payloads around? How are you building it all? So that is what Flex is going to do. It's going to take all of that equipment, everything that you need to do, all those logistics, all those services, and provide the transport and um, the services to do those things that you I need to do. I can't wait to see what you guys <laughs> do up there. My application will be uh, on your desk. Just I have let us know almost an ready. hour of driving that flex already. So, <laughs> so thank you've you seen so what much. it's capable oh, of. It's incredible, incredible. And thank you so much for that Thanks opportunity. Thanks so much, Gotti. Thanks for being with us. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.